right, so we're close to on time, so I'll make sure that we uh, get to lunch relatively close to on time. Um, so we've actually had some really nice talks on some, some detailed physics and processes. Um, I'm going to kind of take a step back out and just give kind of an advertisement of a simulation set that is not quite done yet. Um, so that's why it's going to be more of a, a cursory glance. Uh, I still am processing results every day as we speak, um, keeping tabs on the simulations, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a historical current climate and PGW framework, very similar to everything we've heard so far, uh, over an Alaskan domain. And some quick motivation. So this, this work is funded by the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. So we are taking more of a water resources slant with these simulations. Um, you know, Alaska and the Arctic in general has been subjected to a lot of warming. Um, it's going to be subjected to a lot more warming. Um, you know, these are the observations on the left as far as, you know, we've already seen a couple Fahrenheit. We're going to see many more, you know, 4 to 8 Fahrenheit or 4 to 8 K, uh, depending on what climate model, what projection. Um, but at any rate, these are going to, these, these, this warming is going to drive uh, pretty extensive changes in the water cycle over Alaska, right? So things like thawing of permafrost, partitioning of rain and snow, which we've seen over the lower 48, are also going to happen to a greater degree over the Arctic. Um, so this is going to have large impacts to the water cycle and you know things like how you operate water resource management, how you even operate uh, an installation on permafrost, which I'm not going to talk about here, but um, the core is interested in those things. And previous analyses using dynamical models you know, relied on Core scale GCMs, coarse RCMs, and so the, the typical motivations here, we want to go to a slightly higher resolution um, to, to be relevant for water resources, mesoscale, macroscale hydrology, to have reasonable depictions of you know, flow, orography interactions, um, snowpack, actually getting proper elevation to watch snow melt, as kind of like Alex talked about earlier. You know, those are all the, the things that we care about from a water resource management perspective. So this is our domain. Um, we basically cover the entire T of Alaska and watersheds that drain through Alaska. So I believe we cover the entire Yukon River, <coughs> if that's of, in of interest to any anybody. We have four-kilometer grid spacing, the air interim for ICs and BCs, except for SSTs. We use a, a high-res product from NASA for that. And then in this domain, we actually are a little different than some of the other configurations. We have no spectral nudging. And that's because this domain is, is smaller than something like the Conus domain. It's actually strongly forced throughout the year, so warp tends to not drift from your, your forcing climate, um, so we can actually get away with spec without spectral nudging, which is a huge computational uh, savings. Now, just some, some kind of details on wharf. This is all in a, in a paper that's been published in JAMC as far as the configuration of the model. Uh, it's a Monaghan et al. But Thompson Microphysics, wharf 3.7.1, uh, the NOAMP snow model, which or the NOMP land surface model, which I think Mike probably talked about this morning. Unfortunately, I missed his talk. Um, with some modifications to improve snow melt simulations or snow simulations in general. Uh, and then, like I said earlier, this is the PGW approach, kind of using the standard uh, CONUS SEMA 5 ensemble mean perturbations. And then uh, just for any analysis that I'll talk about here is, is a subset of the simulation. So the simulation is a 14-year simulation. We're only going to look at 10 water years, which has finished on um, the PGW simulations currently on Cheyenne through about 2014 as of uh, yesterday. So just going back to the historical simulation, which was, which was done, um, these are what we've got here is just um, not the right button. <laughs> is there a pointer on here? Oh, there it is. All right. So this is the annual precipitation. Um, the, wetter, bluer colors are more precip. There's no scale. It's not super important. Um, this is some observational product, uh, kind of observational product of record in Alaska from these, these folks up there. It's, it's acronym is SNAP. Again, it's not, it's not important. So these are the annual, annual precips here. Um, and then this is the difference field. So you can kind of see some different. These are at actual specific station observations that we may trust a little bit more. Um, but um, my actual background that I presented last time with this workshop is, is uh, observational uncertainty and things like that. So I'm going to highlight that here um, as kind of a plug to some other things that we're working on. And as an aside, I'm really glad I'll talk about that here. I'm really glad people are acknowledging observational uncertainty in their comparisons to any kind of simulation set. You really need to kind of 
think more holistically about what taking observations to a grid actually means and what it does and what it gives you and what it, what it can't give you. Um, so anyway, there's this, this difference in northeast Alaska where the observations are saying it's actually really dry, Wharf is saying it's wetter. And if you talk to people in Alaska, um, this is pretty confidently underestimating, and that's because you have a lot of snow up there and these gauges aren't necessarily shielded properly, et cetera. There's a lot of trouble measuring snow, right? Um, so this is the situation, actually, we might take WARF as extra information and, you know, put that into some kind of hybrid downscaling or hybrid data set generation, right? So you could do the same thing as Alex does from a downscaling standpoint, but you can use WARF predictors in actually informing your observation of record. Um, but I'm digressing a lot. And as far as snow goes in the historical simulation, it's which showed, uh, Andy did some nice validation. Essentially, we get the SWE cycle right on OMP is a pretty, pretty advanced uh, snow model, uh, except for the, the melt period. So the melt period, uh, actually, the last day of, of, of snow here, um, the wharf is on top. And then some observation from MODIS is on the bottom. And uh, you know, these are the cool colors are earlier in the water year. The warmer colors are later in the water year. So as you can see, there's a difference. If we flip to the actual difference field, Wharf is generally, you know, two weeks earlier. And if we look at a snow tell site, that is interesting. That is not the plot that showed up this morning when I flicked through it, but that's all right. So there's a snow tell site here where you would see that the uh, sweet curve melted out a couple weeks early. And this has been consistently shown, I think, in the CONUS simulations as well, where no MP tends to melt a little bit aggressively. Um, so if you're going to use this simulation set for kind of process studies, hydrology, there, this would be kind of the most impactful deficiency in the simulation set from a, from a snow uh, perspective. And so this is my aside. So the other part of my work is really related to uh, quantifying uncertainty in observational data sets. So these figures I just made in the last uh, day or two, so I apologize for the, the low quality, but this is the wharf simulation for some slice, a couple years, um, and you can see there's these, these mountain ranges that light up in southeast Alaska with a lot of precip, and this is the Brooks Range up here, and you take a different observational data set than the one I showed previously, and you actually see, well, wharf now looks wetter than this observational data set, where if we go back here, wharf is actually supposedly drier than the observations. And that goes back to the fundamental way, like the, the actual methodological choices that go into how these data sets were created. Um, and so what I work on is generating ensembles of, of realizations of the past, and that gives you uncertainty. So you might take the ensemble median and say, well, wharf looks reasonably OK in some regions. There's differences in others. But then you go to an example uncertainty plot, right? And you can say, well, the areas where wharf may disagree the most with the observations are actually some of the areas where it's the hardest for us to interpolate sparse observations to grids, and that's these really wet mountain ranges that have very few observations. You're basically just extrapolating some statistical relationship into high terrain. Um, so you have really strong gradients, and you're trying to extrapolate along that edge leads to high uncertainty. So getting back to the PGW simulation after I, I do that aside. Um, when we're, we're dealing with this domain, um, a lot of the applications of the PGW approach haven't really dealt with sea ice or SST perturbations explicitly when you're dealing with loss of sea ice. So we just had to think a little bit carefully about how we attacked that for the PGW simulation. Um, so strict PGW, you just take some delta right of all your fields, and then you would apply it. So in theory, you could just take the delta in sea ice concentration and apply that to the historical sea ice and, and get some future sea ice concentration. But we know sea ice is very highly nonlinear processes in there when, when things start to melt and, and break. So if we look at doing like the classic PDW perturbation, this is observed sea ice concentration. So reds are close to one, uh, the blues are zero sea ice. And so this is someday, uh, March 1st, 2011, from the observations. You take the delta from the, the CMIP5 ensemble median. Apply that to this field for this day, and this is what you would end up with. And if you look through the record of observations of sea ice and, and see how the pack melts from our best available observations, this actually doesn't really ever happen. You don't see these kind of middling sea ice concentrations very much. You still kind of keep this distinct edge where you have high concentrations back in the pack and then just this very distinct gradient. So what this is saying is that 
we need to be a little bit more careful with how we attack sea ice. And also, as kind of a, a product of these model outputs, skin temperature you might take as your SST perturbation. Well, if you go from a pixel that has sea ice in the current climate to then that same pixel has no sea ice in the future, uh, your skin temperature perturbation might be order 30 Kelvin, right? Because you've got this super cold ice pixel, and now it doesn't have, now it's an ocean, so it's, it's got a lot more thermal inertia, it's, it's a lot warmer. So if you applied that 30K perturbation to an SST, um, you're sitting somewhere in the, you know, five north tropics of the warm pool, right? So um, there's a really easy fix to that. It's just there's another output field in your in your uh, CMIP five archive that's the essentially the near surface. So it's the very top layer of the ocean, and that actually is modeled as a as an as an ocean variable rather than the skin temperature that is the ice or then ocean when it's not ice. And so that gives you a very reasonable perturbation. So this is just an example of that. It's not the greatest color scale. I apologize, but. You know, these are order five to, you know, five to eight K, which you might expect given the atmospheric forcing over, over a century perturbation. So you, you warm these areas. This is, so this is where the ice was currently. And if you took the skin temperature perturbation, you wouldn't necessarily see, you'd see, you know, 20 K or something like that. And now you have just got a nice smoothly varying perturbation. As far as sea ice concentration, what we, we tried to be faithful to the PGW the idea. So the idea is you perturb, again, you perturb this historical weather series with some delta, it's simply, you know, kind of this delta perturbation. Um, but what that, what you may want to do is preserve this variability in the historical period in your sea ice field as well. So the idea here is, since we're really not going to be able to do this on a time, on a daily time scale, we uh, are doing it on an annual time scale. So we. Basically, look at our future SEMA 5 ensemble median sea ice concentration and our historical period. You can do a rank of sea ice extent. So, say 2005 as rank one, most sea ice extent. You then go to the future scenario or the future time period, find the year with the greatest sea ice extent, and then that defines your sea ice in the PGW simulation. So it's so it's maintaining interannual variability. So the years in the historical record that have a lot of sea ice are going to be the years that have uh, GCM informed sea ice in the future. And so the idea is that we're trying to maintain some faithfulness to the PGW approach, but also give some appreciation for the fact that sea ice is a highly nonlinear process. So then the same example day, you go from this to this. So this is the correspondingly ranked year in the CMIP 5 future ensemble median. And that's another little point on sea ice concentration. You want to deal with medians rather than means because you smear the field out um, since you're averaging a bounded variable. Um, this gives you kind of this distinct cutoff where the sea ice is melting. So how am I doing on time? Five minutes? OK. I was checking my little timer here. So, so as far as some cursory results, um, I think these results are all consistent with what we've seen so far. Um, Alex showed a nice demonstration. So this is an annual mean two meter temperature and you see immediately these regions that keep snow most of the year are are more resistant to warming so this is the brooks range highlight coming out here um you can also kind of see maybe uh near denali here um as far as the the near background field they have slightly less warming because they're they're keeping snow more through the year um and then in this this domain you see a a, a really huge change so to get kind of this field you can think about in mins and max temperatures, but this is just looking at kind of an extreme max and min. So this is a really simple way to just grab the, the yearly max, so the one day of the year, the warmest temperature, and then you average, in this case, 10 together. And so what this is saying is that the, the kind of the extreme maximums aren't necessarily increasing that fast, except for these areas where you've lost your snow. So you see the snow albedo feedback here, maybe, where these are on the margins of permanent snowpack, potentially. But the minimum where you've lost the sea ice, now your minimums are extremely increased relative to the, the current climate. And this does feed onshore a little bit, but you, know, you can obviously see this is mainly a, an ocean feature. Um, but I think this is kind of, so these are very different scales. So this goes from 0 to 24. This is 0 to 8. So you know, three times as much on the, on the extreme minimums. And this is, again, consistent with what you see in GCMs and what we've seen in some of the other RCM uh, simulations. Um, so, so over here is, is total precipitation. I think this is pretty expected within the PGW framework. Um, it's warmer and moister, so over a limited domain, you'd expect more precipitation generally with the same weather. Um, so that's nice to see. You know, see the mountain ranges are lighting up where there's 
uh, obviously then in net increased flux into the mountain ranges. Um, as far as snowfall, we have an increase in precipitation, but we're significantly warmer in this region. And you see generally the snow in an absolute sense is, is neutral or decreasing, especially in the warm coastal regions. But where it's cold, um, again, we see this in the CONUS and the Himalayas and other regions where it's cold, you actually get an increase in snow. Um, but from a fractional sense, uh, generally it's a, it's a decrease. And I think you know, these, these obviously have implications for the hydrologic cycle. You know, is, is the snowpack getting rained on or is the snowpack getting snowed on? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting ecological things that we're going to start looking at here as far as quality of the pack, foraging. You know, is the, is the pack just iced over because it has now been raining on snow? Not flooding raining on snow, but just rain on snow. Um, and then from a SWE standpoint, I'll just finish up. Uh, this is very similar to what we see in CONUS. So uh, elevation changes is proxy for climate. Where it's colder, the SWE increases. Where it's cooler, SWE decreases in a fractional sense. So this is 60% decrease to 60% increase over this 10-year average. And then you can break that out into heat plots and see generally in the north, you get more increases. In the south, you get decreases. So this is an advertisement. This, this simulation set is done. We're looking for uh, users for applications. Um, we've already had a couple initial applications and inquiries, but the historical simulation has been published. PGW simulation will be out the door shortly. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to collaborate on this and other things. So thank you.